day. We've had a really fabulous day so far, and I don't think we're going to be getting any less for this last session. So let's get started then. I'm going to introduce our speaker, Elaine, Elaine Bernard is the executive director of the Labor and Work Life Program at Harvard Law School and the Harvard Trade, Trade Union Program. She was born and raised in Canada, and Dr. Bernard has a BA from the University of Alberta, so she's not unfamiliar with the snow and the cold. Uh, she uh, has an MA from the University of British Columbia and a PhD from Simon Fraser University. She is a lifelong unionist and activist and has conducted courses on a wide variety of topics for unions, community groups, universities, and government departments. Her current research and teaching interests are in the areas of international comparative labor movements, union leadership and governance, and the role of unions in promoting civil society, democracy, and equality. Dr. Bernard is going to speak to us this afternoon about the importance to our society of the right to organize and join unions, and why that right is at the very core of our democracy. Dr. Bernard. Thank you. Boy, uh, this is my first time on the University of Alberta in uh, more years than I want to take claim for. And uh, most of the University of Alberta wasn't here when I was here. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, the food's greatly improved. I used to tell people, uh, the food was so bad in the cafeteria that we used to run over to the university hospital and eat in their cafeteria. <laughs> so it's funny, everybody understands that's a definition of how bad food can be, but obviously, uh, uh, and I'm sure it was the student organizing uh, that, that brought that about. Well, I'm not going to go through um, a lot of discussion about the crisis we're facing, because many of the other speakers have talked about it, the uh, neoliberalism, the austerity campaign, the war on workers, uh, and it's not just an international campaign, it's also happening here in Canada. Uh, what we've seen is increasingly, you know, the way I think of it is nationalizing the debt, so we pay the debt, and privatizing the profits. Um, we saw this in the extreme in the U.S. with the 2008 uh, 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 financial crisis, but it's not just there. Uh, I work with a lot of people. One of the areas I, I teach in now is strategic planning. And I have a friend who says to me that every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. And if you don't like the results, you have to change the system. And I think that's what we're facing today. Now, there's tremendous anger out there. and I know this is a university audience. I'm trying to keep it clean. But I can tell you that that doesn't say jump, you financiers. Uh, <laughs> so there's a lot of anger. But often, the anger is turned internally. It's not targeted. It's not organized. Um, and I think it's a. You know, following a little bit on what Jane talked about, about organizing, what organizing means. I don't go back to the Magna Carta. That was a little before my time. Uh, but but uh, a number of years ago, one of the things I do is I'm not an insomniac, but occasionally I have difficulty sleeping. And so I try to get books that people tell you you should read, but I never read. And I read them, and it's really good. I fall asleep quite quickly, uh, but occasionally I actually get through them. And one was Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America. And when I hit this quote, I thought, wow, he's really got it. In democratic countries, the knowledge of how to combine is the mother of all other forms of knowledge. On its progress depends that of all others. And I thought, uh, you know, we try to find different ways of talking about organizing. And when I saw organizing being referred to as the knowledge of how to combine, and you know, knowledge is not something that you just pick up. It's, it's a lifetime of effort. 
And so the notion that learning to combine, learning to be a collective, learning to be active is not something that you just do easily. It's something that takes a lifetime to do. And each new generation has to learn it themselves. And this knowledge of how to combine being at the fundamental basis of, of a democracy. And so for me, what is organizing? Well, it's identifying shared interests among a group of people. It's forging a community prepared to act on those interests and building power from that united community. Now, one of the problems we're facing and an aspect of the neoliberal agenda was to turn us all from citizens into consumers, from collectives into individuals. We all remember that famous quote by Margaret Thatcher, God, you know, there's no such thing as individuals, uh, or there's no such thing as society. There's just individuals and their families. Right? So everybody is an individual, isolated. And it's sort of interesting. If everybody's an individual and there's no such thing as society, almost any big issue can't be resolved because you can't deal with it individually. Individually, I can buy a car, you know, big deal. Individually, I can't set up an energy efficient mass transportation system. That's a collective answer. Most of the big problems we've got in the world require collective action, collective. So to the extent to which we can, uh, the powers to be, the profiteers, can convince us that we're just individuals and that there's no such thing as society, they win. They win over and over again. So it really comes down to how you view yourself in the world? Am I just uh, one citizen in a nation of consumers uh, that I look at the very nature of our relationship as, well, what am I putting in it and what am I getting out? That's the sort of individual consumer view. Or do I have a wider view? Do I recognize the things that are given to me that maybe sometimes you don't even see? Uh, there's a senator in my state named uh, Elizabeth Warren who, uh, uh, yeah, who, who, who got a lot of attention because one of her talks uh, just in a get together in somebody's house as she was running for uh, U.S. Senate happened to say that you know no entrepreneur, no businessman, no entrepreneur makes it on his own. That's a fraud. They have all sorts of things that have been given to them by the society. You know, uh, the old labor leaders used to say, you know, uh, we're riding on other people's backs. Everybody, everybody has all sorts of assets, all sorts of things that are brought to them from the community. And viewing the nation as, and viewing society as a collective is very, very important. And that's where unions come in, because if we think about what unions do, fundamentally what unions do, warts and all, unions construct a community of interests among a group of workers. Now sometimes, sometimes they choose a very narrow group of workers, and that's a problem. Sometimes they choose to be an exclusive group rather than a continual growing group. But the notion of constructing a community, you know, communities don't just exist, they have to be consciously construct, constructed, is at the heart of what unionism is. And it's at the heart of what organizing is. Organizing starts by defining the community. Who is the community? Is the community Alberta? Is the community Edmonton? Does it start with the community of folks here in the Garneau uh, area? Do, what's our community? And then as we start to look at our community and we start to talk to each other, how do we start to 
develop a common purpose. And a common purpose isn't something that's floated in. You know, I'm going to walk in and say, well, this is really important, so let's all, who's in favor of Elaine's common purpose? It comes from discussion. It comes from understanding what people are doing, what matters, what their values are. So you develop common purpose. And then having a common purpose isn't something that you put under your pillow and hope that, you know, uh, sort of like the uh, tooth fairy, you put it under your pillow and someday you wake up and you discover your common purpose has been resolved. Uh, no, you, you actually have to get out and start to take action. Take action to transform society so that you breathe life into that common purpose and you make that dream a reality. That's what organizing is about. It's about sharing that knowledge of uh, of how to combine, and it's how we use what we have to acquire what we need to get what we want. Now, whenever I use this definition, I use it a lot in organizing, I, I always, I don't know, it's a definition that brings out the whiners. Because the minute they say, how to use what we have Oh, we don't have anything. We don't have nothing. Ain't got nothing. You know, uh, the corporations, you know, they've got the media. They got the billions of dollars. They got the power, you know. Poor little me, we got nothing. And I mean, it's nonsense. It's nonsense. Because, you know, my favorite is, they got the media. Who the hell watches? Who under the age of 40 watches the news? <laughs> Nobody. We got John Stewart, okay? We got John Stewart, and I will put him against any of the other media. So thinking about what we have, what we have is our commitment. What we have is our time. And I know a lot of folks are very busy. Let me tell you a secret. I am a very busy person. Remarkably enough, if it's something I really want to do, somehow, I find the time to do it. So the issue to me, took a long time to figure this out, is that time is very directly related to motivation. Uh, is this worth my time? Is this something that I can be involved in? Do I want to be involved in? And when we think of resources, what we have, it's not just our time, our emotion, our commitment. It's sometimes even things, I'll give you an example. A very poor community uh, was the community of black workers in, uh, uh, in Tennessee. They didn't have much money, couldn't really take on the bus companies, but could take them on by refusing, by boycotting, by boycotting. And all of a sudden, their choice to walk as opposed to ride buses created a crisis for the bus company. So the resources we have, sometimes, you know, we need to look at what they are. In the labor movement, I don't believe anybody in the labor movement who says we don't have resources. We have tremendous resources. The question is, will we marshal those resources to figure out what we need? Will we use them properly to leverage what we need to get what we want? And will we be clear about what we want, what the objective is? So what we've seen over the last number of years is a real war on unions. This is the war on unions and collective bargaining in the United States. Jane mentioned uh, the fight in Wisconsin. But we've been having a war against unions in Canada as well. This is Cup W, this is uh, the Air Canada employees legislated back to work. Teachers, teachers, uh, uh, it's very interesting. They're really going after health and education in particular. And uh, uh, it reminds me of, uh, of uh, there's a very famous, uh, Willie Sutton was a bank robber. And uh, a really dumbass reporter once asked him, why do you rob banks? And he said, because that's where the money is. So, uh, 
So why go after education? Why go after health care with privatization? With, because that's where the money is. That's where the money is. And that's why they're going after the public sector right now. But they're also doing it because there's widespread decline in union density. That's the proportion of the workforce that's unionized in most countries. Though I would argue in many countries where they have different labor laws, while the membership may de be declining, the rights that the membership have won through legislation still is quite widespread. But the most severe decline has been in the private sector. And in every country you see uh, uh, a huge split in union density between the public sector and the private sector. And as that gap widens, one of the things that's happened is, well, today in the United States, uh, a majority of trade unionists in the United States are public employees. In Canada, 75% uh, of the work uh, of the unionized, hmm, 75% of public employees are unionized. It's only about 17% in the private sector. And the reasons for the decline are, are multiple. It's not just you know, the attack on unions. It is, in fact, globalization, globalization, international trade agreements, political integration, the race to the bottom. It is, of course, change in organization uh, of production, uh, just-in-time systems, lean anorexic production, uh, uh, new inventory si systems, offshoring. It is, in fact, uh, a move away from job-based and workplace uh, focus of employment. It is, you know, our labor laws read as if, uh, um, uh, as if we live in a world of the 1930s with large, concentrated workplaces. And it is, of course, the uh, uh, rise of precarious employment and changing of the employment relationship. But equally as important is the hostility of employers, and in particular, one of the very large employers, which is government, which is not just an employer, but an employer that gets to write their own rules. And so we've seen in the last number of years, at least 10 years, a global war on, in fact, the public sector unions. The public sector, this is from The Economist, the battle ahead confronting public sector unionism. Now Canada is a bit of a curious case. Canada's a bit of an outlier. Uh, whenever I travel to other countries and I show data about unions, they look and they say, well, Wait a minute, for the last 10 years, the Canadian labor movement has sort of held its own at about you know, 30, 32%. So it is a little bit of a, of a curious case. And maybe we can talk a little bit about you know, what works as well as what hasn't worked. Here you see the density. Alberta, of course, is uh, uh, not where it wants to be, uh, right here at the bottom. But uh, I like to say at 24% union density, Get a grip on yourself. That means one in four workers is unionized in, in this province. That, by the way, at 24%, North American wide puts it at the highest level of the United States uh, state union density. So 24% is, you know, it, it's a good base to to work from. If you view it as a base to grow, as opposed to, woe is me, uh, you know, what's happening here. Um, now, a lot of what the labor movement has been doing over the last few years is it's been back on its heels, very much on the defensive. Uh, you know, we look at all the benefits that historically unions have won, whether it's job security, salary protection, you know, paid vacations, uh, fair treatment, uh, voice and scheduling, premier pay for overtime, say in hiring, uh, you know, united voice in dealing with the employer, impartial process for resolving complaints, protection against unfair treatment, a role in setting and enforcing uh, occupational safety standards, collective power in uh, uh, um, uh, standard setting and promotion of the profession, uh, all of those things, but they're 
mostly things that unionized employers have, unionized employees have. And of course, one of the things that happens is in a labor market is you're either growing or contracting. If you win it for yourself, that's good, but you won't hold on to it if you can't spread it around. That's the reality. And so for unions, it often means starting to, you know, first you have a defensive campaign, but then you really need to get back to, and I think maybe I'm approaching the same question from a slightly different direction as Jane's looking at, it really means going back to basics about what do unions do. And I mean, unions are fundamentally, and let's be clear about this, organizations for winning rights. That we really don't have a whole lot of rights before there were unions in the workplace. Unions won rights. And then it wasn't just enough to win rights, but we then discovered that having things in paper isn't the same as being able to exercise them. So the union, creates a vehicle for people to exercise the rights that they win. And then they become schools for, and I do like the term democracy, schools for uh, people understanding that they have not only the right to participate in decisions that affect them, but hell, I think you've got a responsibility to participate in decisions that affect you. And uh, much of the experience in the workplace is the complete opposite. People go into workplace, sit down, shut up, and do what you're told. And it's only through a union that you start to gather, construct a community, and start to say, well, wait, wait a minute. We're, we're doing the damn work here. Uh, you know, we've got some insight and some knowledge and skill. Maybe we should have a voice in what the hell's happening here. And so saying to people that, you know, that that's important, and we've got to do that. And uh, so by doing that, they end up constructing a community of interest within the workplace amongst workers to talk about their jobs, their lives, their work, and, uh, uh, and then providing a voice. We often use the term voice over exit. This is, a, this is a great term that economists like to say. They say unions provide voice. What they mean by that is that the union provides and is a vehicle for a critical feedback loop into a system. So uh, the frontline workers, the workers who are actually doing the work, uh, who have certain understandings, are able to bring that information uh, and demand some corrections and improvements. Any system that's going to improve has to have a critical feedback loop. A system without a critical feedback loop, technically, is called stupid. So you either have stupid systems, uh, uh, and you know, I, I mean, I, uh, like most people, I like to watch people work, but no matter how carefully I watch, I don't have the same knowledge as somebody who actually does it. And so the knowledge of people who are actually doing the work, that that be collectively uh, uh, represented and spoken for. And by the way, this notion of exit is that, think about it. You don't like the way things are here? No problem. Leave. Go find another job. Well, what sort of society would, would we be if everybody who ran into a problem basically just decided, oh, there's a problem here. Well, guess I'll leave that place. Uh, as opposed to rolling up our sleeves and saying, no, we're going to change it, we're going to change it, we're going to improve it, we're going to make it better. Uh, so the notion of voice over exit actually is an aid to an employer. Not that I've ever seen a whole lot of them say, hey, wow, union will increase voice, protect workers uh, to give critical feedback, great. Uh, not usually, but it's a vital, vital uh, uh, thing that unions do. And as such, that's why in public policy, not to be confused with reality, in public policy, uh, internationally, we recognize unions as one of the key vehicles for promoting democracy in the workplace, economic, social justice, and equality. And of course, beyond wages, 
Uh, unions play a very important political role. And you'll notice part of what they're going after unions today is trying to delegitimate unions being involved in politics. You know, like somehow corporations, well, that's okay. I mean, they got a right to do that. But unions uh, and union dues, which is members democratically deciding to take positions on policies that they believe will assist working people, somehow that's not legitimate. The idea that unions, sh who but unions should be involved in politics as democratic organizations, they need to be in politics. They need to organize around social goods. And social goods, by the way, are about acquiring, making universal, think about healthcare. Uh, think about many of the issues. First, you win it through collective bargaining, but through collective bargaining, it will always be only a tiny minority of folks who have that. If you're going to keep it, then that's not good enough. It needs to be socialized. And you do that through legislation. You do that through politics so that if we can first try things and win things through collective bargaining, but then to keep them, we need to grow it. We need to make it possible for everybody to have that. And then, you know, from a union perspective, I, I have some crazy discussions in the US. I, I, um, I'm not surprisingly, uh, I'm sure you're not surprised, in favor of universal, comprehensive, quality health care for all. I think, I think it's a basic right. This, this, and a right, by the way, should not be confused with the business. Health care should be a right, not a business. Uh, when I have this discussion in the US, confidentially, I'll have US unionists sometimes come up to me and say, well, you know, Elaine, I, I don't know. I mean, if everybody had health care, why would people join unions? I say to them, well, wait a minute. You know, like, like uh, uh, you know, we do ceilings, not just floors. I mean, like if everybody, <laughs> if everybody's got health care, you know, that's the end of your agenda? We couldn't pull a few people together and think of a couple other things we could go for after that, you know? Uh, you know, so, uh, so don't worry about it. If everything, the best unions in the world won, was socialized, you know what? There's a few other things we could go for. So um, thinking about the role of unions in first winning social goods, identifying social goods, and mobilizing, organizing, and bringing together a constituency and organizing a constituency to fight for those goods is very important. Economic fairness for workers in general, and that means sort of uh, I think more today than ever before. Uh, I, I'm one of these people who always sees the glass half full, not empty. You probably figured that out already. So when I see the attacks and unions on the defensive, I look at that and I say, well, you know, that's terrible and they shouldn't be, but this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity to talk about you can't hold on to what you got unless you spread it around. That's the lesson that we, we need to start talking about. Uh, things like thinking about things like a living wage, which, uh, uh, you know, there's been some very interesting campaigns in the US about that. The labor movement sort of, in some places, has figured that, you know, that a living wage maybe will not directly affect their members, but truth be told, it will, because you know, you bring up the bottom, everybody else is going to move up a little bit. Not a problem. Uh, and so things like pensions, having public pensions, improving the Canada pension, making it uh, better for everyone helps us. Uh, fighting for democracy and the right and responsibility uh, to participate. And things like learning how to be a democracy, learning how to participate. Uh, because there's a lot of, of uh, 
things right now attempting to push people out of organizations, out of action, out of participation. And you know, one of the things that unions do for a lot of working people is it's the first time they've been in an organization of self-governance, self-governance, where, you know, uh, I remember the first time I went to a union meeting. It's the first time I ever heard of this dude, Robert, who wrote these rules. Robert's rules. Well, I changed them. I started calling them Roberta's rules. And Roberta was a little more flexible. But, uh, uh, but she was democratic. And so, you know, thinking about how you learn to run large organizations democratically, how to participate. You know, in the labor movement, I always say you're not Jesus. You don't have to love them all, but you do have to represent them all. And, you know, I mean, that's what makes it wonderful, which is that it's a community not necessarily of our choosing. And that's another neat thing. Remember, the employer hires folks. The union doesn't. The union doesn't sort of sit there and say, oh, excuse me, Mr. Boss, don't hire this person. Oh, geez, this person's a disaster. Don't go with them. Uh, the employer hires them, and then we have to go in there and construct a community amongst them. And that's sort of neat, because you know what? The dirty secret, even in Canada, is most of us choose where we're going to live. We choose our friends. Some of us choose our religion, or it was passed down from our parents. So in a lot of cases, we construct communities of choice. In the workplace, often, it's not a community of choice. It's a real community that's, th that's there but it's not a community. So we have to turn it into a community. And that's a very exciting and important thing for a, a democracy. And of course, part of that is developing the leadership skills of organizing uh, that is so vital for the lifeblood of any democracy. So why unions matter to society is because, you know, they teach the knowledge of how to combine. And play a vital countervailing force uh, or provide a countervailing force to the key problem we face in the world today, which is the concentration of wealth and power. And the only way we can change and start to break up this concentration of wealth and power is by building powerful countervailing institutions, organizations, movements, that will shake things up. Now, because I'm here in the prairies, because I grew up in some of the politics of this and some of the other provinces, uh, everybody knows who this is. This is J.S. Woodsworth, who uh, uh, was the founder of the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, uh, a leader in the Winnipeg General Strike of 1919. And uh, the quote there is the quote uh, that became the motto of the British Columbia Federation of Labor. I think represents the finest of what labor is. What we desire for ourselves, we wish for all. And that's that notion of you can't hold on to what you got unless you spread it around. And there's a number of lessons that we have and that I fear sometimes we're forgetting in the labor movement that we learn from prairie labor. One part of it was socialize the gains. Move from collective agreements to public policy. You can't hold on to what you got unless you spread it around. The second is advocate on behalf of public goods and public welfare. That, you know, that, that your collective agreement is only a part of the wage scale that you enjoy. A big part of the rest of it is, in fact, the public goods that we all share in. And by the way, on public goods, seeing the public sector and public goods as wealth creating. This is one of the most annoying things that neoliberalism has done. First, they, they got into the language of wealth uh, and wealth creation. Uh, as if, you know, whatever happened to creating a better society, whatever happened to justice, whatever, oh no, our societies need to be wealth creation. And then, but they never define wealth. I mean, you, you picture, you know, 
stooge and uh, uh, somebody out of Monopoly gathering a whole bunch of, you know, toys. That's, that's what wealth is. But if you think about real wealth, uh, wealth creation is often done by, first, there's no, there's no private wealth that is created without the underpinning of the public sector. Yeah, the roads, the education, uh, the health care, all of the things that make possible private wealth creation. But there's also public wealth creation. That is clean, clean water, safe water, air, all of the things that we enjoy in the environment, our education system, these are all forms of public wealth. You know, I used to joke about it, and now I can't joke about it because it's become a reality. In every place in Canada, we have clean, potable water. If you take that water and you put it in bottles and sell it, that's not wealth creation. That's the transfer of wealth creation without compensation. It's called theft. So what we're seeing is massive theft of the commons, and we're calling it wealth creation. The public sector is a form of wealth creation. It's just a different form of wealth creation. It's called public wealth. We used to even have a term for it, common wealth. It's wealth that we, as a society, hold in common and that we can all share in. So the public sector creates public wealth, common wealth. And so it's not just the way it's being painted by politicians as, you know, uh, private sector creates wealth, public sector costs. No, public sector creates wealth not only for all of us, but it's the very basis upon which private wealth is created as well. Organizing, organizing all workers. Uh, and there, there we've got a, a little bit of, of issue. In the labor movement, we've always viewed organizing workers in a very narrow way of you know, signing up, uh, becoming a member, et cetera. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about some ways that unions have now started to organize workers. I actually think that when we say organize all workers, uh, it, it actually means that as unions, we need to start to look at campaigns, and activities and moments where we can join with other groups in the community to actually be involved in organizing and use our knowledge of how to build democratic, active communities uh, to spread that knowledge of how to combine. And finally, to organize politically. Uh, a, a huge difference that I've always observed between the Canadian labor movement and the American labor movement, and I'll put it as I like to do in simple terms, when I meet with my colleagues in the US and they dream in technicolor of having real power, they dream of having you know, maybe uh, uh, a seat at the table, being to, able to influence, influence their rulers. Now, I was raised in the prairie labor tradition of I wanted to own the place. I wanted to be part of the rulers. I wanted a democratic uh, regime. I wanted a society where we would elect bus drivers and nurses and, you know, healthcare workers and uh, social workers. That would be our government, not a government of lawyers, for lawyers, and for the corporations. And so this notion of actually having a political agenda, and a political agenda that isn't a lobbying agenda, but a political agenda about ruling, about what sort of society we want to be, and how we will rule. And that's why Prairie Labor, fairly early on, created its own political party. And the party it created in 1932 in this province, okay, in the south of the province, but nevertheless, in this province was Farm Labor Socialist Party. That's what its name was, Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, uh, Farm Labor Socialist Party. And its desire was to rule, to rule 
democratically on behalf of us all. And one of my fears is that we're losing that notion. Real power, real power uh, comes from being able to govern. And so, you know, we can lobby uh, till the cows come home, but ultimately we need to have a program and an organization, not just in our community, not just our unions, and not go cap in hand to our masters, but to really become the masters of our own destiny. That was the dream that needs to be the dream today. So, uh, now you've seen a lot of attacks on collective bargaining. And in the US right now, in the majority of the states, and even the states that have collective bargaining rights, there's a prevalent belief that is being shipped up here that collective bargaining is a privilege, not a right. Well, you know, even the Canadian Supreme Court understands that, you know, this is a right. We had collective bargaining, we exercised that right. You see, rights are indivisible. Uh, rights are things you exercise, they're not given to you. Uh, you can be denied your rights, but that doesn't mean you don't have a right. It just means somebody's big and powerful and denying it. But collective bargaining is, in fact, in Canada, a human right. And it's understood as such by the Canadian Supreme Court. And it comes from freedom of association applies in the workplace. And that's a massive, massively important notion. Freedom of association is in the workplace. And it means, because you know these terms up here, what does it mean in practice? Well, it means the right to organize. And what are you organizing for, lunch? No, to form an organization, a union. And then why did you form that organization? Well, you want to put your rights in writing, you want to collectively bargain. So, it follows that freedom of association means the right to organize, it means the right to collectively bargain, and in fact, I would say it also means the right to strike. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's a right that's exercised by workers. And there's a great decision by the Canadian Supreme Court where they point out, uh, because people challenged it, uh, a couple of uh, uh, provinces and uh, their allies said, well, wait a minute, you know, collective bargaining was uh, given to Canadian workers by the legislatures. And you know, the Supreme Court, in its wisdom, said, well, wait a minute, Canadian workers have been striking before there was even a Canada, so I guess it predates the legislature. Uh, so uh, our problem is that in unions, and this feeds in a little bit to what Jane's saying, is in Canada, um, the vast majority of our unions, we have this image that this is how people come to unions, right? You know, Norma Ray, you know, you jump up on the table, if anybody can still find a table and, and in a workplace, and you put up a sign that says union, and people, you know, join and they form. Uh, that's bullshit. The vast majority of Canadian union members, the overwhelming majority of Canadian union members, did not join a union through organizing. They actually got a job in a unionized workplace and found that either as part of the conditions of employment, uh, they were a union member, or somebody went up to them and said, hey, you know, uh, this is what everybody does here, sign this, yeah, okay, what, whatever. Uh, yeah, anybody under 40 would have said, whatever. Uh, so the vast majority of members didn't join a union through an organizing campaign, and then we act as if they're all Norma Ray. You know, you've joined, and you know. So, re and, and of course, almost none of them came into the labor movement uh, or sought the jobs they did as a stealth method to become a union leader, okay? They got the jobs that they got because they sort of looked good. And sometimes they didn't even realize they were seeking jobs in unionized settings. So for the labor movement, there is a massive organizing, internal organizing campaign today, which is how do we breathe life back into, 
How do we bring the union and what unions really are and this knowledge of how to combine back inside our movement so that in building and rebuilding our movement, we can take it out? And you know, there's a whole literature of this, which also puts you to sleep, uh, about how institutions or movements become institutions and become becalmed. And that's certainly what has happened to some segments of our, of, of our movement. So it means going back to recapturing uh, the movement. Uh, one way I think of it is uh, movements light fires. You know, if uh, you talk to a union leader and you say, or a full-time rep, and you say, what do you do? Oh, I'm always putting out fires. Mm, they should retire. Uh, it, it's not about putting out fires. No movement puts out fires. They light fires. They light fires. And they inspire folks to, to stand up for their rights, to take action. And so it means going back to a movement of fire lighters as opposed to... Uh, uh, and organizers are fire lighters. It's that leadership skill of getting co-workers involved in struggle and moving them from the passive dues payers, which unfortunately is a majority of the movement today, even in the Canadian labor movement, to active participants and owners and leaders in the workplace and community. And that, that is, in essence, what is organizing. And it is, in essence, finding what a labor movement for the 21st century will, will look like? Well, first and foremost, it's got to share this knowledge of how to combine. And there's some knowledge there. There's some knowledge there. Because, you know, Jane talked about how important strikes are for the transformative uh, action that it brings about. That, you know, it's the first time for many people where they stand up uh, and, and really take a, a risk and uh, speak on their own behalf and take on power and, and hopefully win. And once you've done that, you learn, the process is learning a whole lot about this knowledge of how to combine. And then it's focusing on economic justice and equality for all, which means not just fighting the defensive battles, but because, you know, the defensive battles are very demoralizing. Have you ever done that? You work tremendously difficult. You put together all sorts of things, and you succeed. And at the end of the day, you've managed not to go backwards, and you consider that a victory. Well, yeah, that's a victory of sorts, but boy, it's tiring. So actually, you know, if you're going to put that much effort in, then it's best not to just be a defensive campaign. It's worth it to start thinking about something uh, uh, that might be move us a little further. Uh, it's also a movement that creates value, uh, not just through defense, but through growing the commons. And that's why the current attack against public employees and the public sector right now is, is so important, because public goods such as the environment, clean air, water, education, public safety, public health, are, are really being on the front line of the question of what sort of society uh, we will be. And it means also exploring a variety of worker organizations. I was surprised years ago in reading about the history of the labor movement and realizing at the turn of the last century, we had suffrage, uh, women's suffrage organizations that were affiliated to labor councils. Well, nowadays, you know, oh no, you have to be a union to affiliate to a labor council. Well, not anymore. Why, why the hell not? Who the hell are our allies? If they're organized, you all come in. You know, make it a big tent. Uh, things like, uh, in, the, in the US, we have things like worker centers, which uh, some of them are, are more spirited, more participatory than almost any of the unions I know. And interestingly enough, the very conservative US labor movement has started to say, well, 
You know, these are worker organizations. What's the difference between an association, a union, a worker organization? Let's, let's think about who we are. Some of the earliest unions uh, 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 were, you know, uh, educational organizations. They were benevolent societies. They were co-ops, used to be part of the labor movement. So let's look at some of those other exciting new organizations. Uh, and, and it means shifting the political narrative to awakening the inner citizen. Move from taxpayer consumers to civic-minded participants in community building, shared responsibility for solutions. And that's why I'm so big on politics, that, you know, uh, uh, that as long as we're responding to a pile of naked uh, proposals, it's only when we start using our own language to talk about what we want as opposed to what we don't want that we're going to make some gains. And it's creating the future, maintaining the public structures, and talking about the public structures that we have in this uh, province, this country, this world, to maintain quality of life. It's about stewardship and planning. Well, there's really no magic bullet here. It's a very old lesson of agitate, educate, and organize. Uh, but what we're seeing is that there's more and more people who are starting to get through to this. Uh, I love this. You, you know things are messed up when librarians start marching. Uh, I, uh, as I said, I'm half full, not half empty, so I can't help, but I think it's very unfortunate that uh, uh, um, as, a, as a country, we... Uh, we didn't learn as much as I think we could have from the wonderful strikes of the students two years ago in Quebec. Uh, it's a real model example. Jane talked about the, the workers in Connecticut. Boy, the, the students in Quebec, what a story. Two years ago, the students who had the lowest tuition of any students in North America were faced with frankly, a relatively modest uh, uh, tuition increase that would be brought in over five years. Uh, and uh, they decided to, to build a, uh, organize a campaign to stop that. And they didn't stop there. First, the way they're organized in Quebec is very different than any other student movement. They're actually uh, uh, a mass participatory student movement. Uh, that is, they don't have this bureaucratic student council. No. Uh, each department in each school has its own membership meeting, where the membership all comes in, discusses it. And so the students decided to not tolerate this. They decided to go on strike. And uh, the strike was uh, relatively massive. Uh, it was so massive, in fact, that uh, it led to uh, various legislation, uh, legislative attempts to try and prevent, first the government, the liberal government of Jean Charest, thought that, well, you know, by summer, surely this will knock off. The students also thought, let's not just, why is this fee increase happening? What's going on now? They're trying to put austerity on our back. Uh, so this, this can't be just about we don't want to pay more fees. Let's change the discourse. Let's start talking about in a time of recession, in a time uh, of tightening the belts, what the hell is the importance of education? What sort of society do we want to be? And they built a massive massive campaign, uh, draconian legislation was brought in. Hell, if you think librarians marching, how about the lawyers marching? Uh, you know, why austerity? Why, why do we have to take it? What type of society do we want uh, uh, to have? So the government then did what governments do when faced with a massive uprising like that. They thought, let's call an election. No better way to demobilize people. Uh, and the government lost the election. And the incoming government uh, withdrew the legislation. Now, that tells us that, you know, even a small campaign that starts on something that may not seem like earth moving, we don't know what's going to do it. 
My mother used to have that, you, know, you remember the nursery tale? Uh, for the want of a nail, a shoe was lost. For the want of a shoe, a horse was lost. For the want of a horse, a knight was lost. For the want of a knight, a kingdom was lost. All for the want of a nail. As organizers, sometimes we want to find that damn nail. You know, whichever one will, you don't know. You don't know, but you do know if you don't get in, it's not going to happen. Here's an example from Quebec, and really it comes down to the best way to predict the future is to create it, and it is in our hands to do that, and the labor movement is a vital vehicle for doing that, but it means transforming labor, and through transforming labor, transforming us. So, thank you. Oh, I ran a little late, did I? Thank you very much for such a rousing and energizing presentation. And uh, we have some time for questions. If anyone uh, has a question, yes, over at the back. Uh, I think there are mics. Yes, you, this young woman. Sorry, we're coming with the mics, I think. Are there mics? Ah, oh, yes. Hi. Thank you very much for the presentation. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Um, so my question is, um, last evening we saw a guy standing talking about the future of unions has to be to adapt. And so my question is, um, you obviously have quite a bit of knowledge about unions. How are you seeing them adapt to the new um, jobs, the new conditions for employment, um, in terms of both their the way that they're structured and the way that they're recruiting? Okay, do you want to take a few? Okay, we could take a, a couple more and then, and then uh, was there another question? Am I just not seeing that? Any other questions? Uh, there's one right here, yes. Uh, hi. Um, one of the uh, failings that we have at our, or one of the shortcomings we have at our local by being a public sector local, it's really hard to mobilize the workers who are unionists just by virtue of their employment position. How do we reach out to those members best? Yes. Hi, um, my question comes from the perspective of a non-employee union perspective, uh, uh, the National Farmers Union. We are, um, we are self-employed, but we try to be part of the union movement, and yet the organized labor does, has such a hard time because there's no boss to fight against, and they don't, they, they really have trouble including us in that circle because we're not part of that us them dynamic. Sure. Um, let me go backwards. Uh, not just the farmers, but also co ops, because uh, some union organizing is based purely on, and I would say the Alinsky, look for an enemy and, you know, go after uh, uh, them. Uh, you can also, uh, so that a lot of unions have difficulty, and I've, I've helped mediate some of this stuff, where, you know, you organize a co-op and who's the boss? Well, you know, we all own the organization, uh, so here's, here's, you know, we don't have a boss formally. Well. There's no reason why organizations like that. Uh, first, they can still have conflicts. So you need to have some sort of representation model and some conflict uh, 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 amelioration system. But secondly, I mean, historically, organizations like the CCF, where farm labor, socialists, uh, brought in a whole lot of representational organizations. 
Uh, so really, you don't, you don't have to organize always by uh, uh, seeking to only eliminate the bad. You can also organize by seeking to grow the good. Uh, when I'm working with some women in some areas where they find it very depressing that always we're trying to organize by finding what's wrong and after a while they're tired, they don't want to go to a meeting to talk about what's wrong because I'm fed up with what's wrong. Uh, I'll often break the ice by saying, so what works for you? What makes your workplace interesting? Why the hell do you come to work? Is there anything that's going on good here? Uh, and then they'll start saying, yeah, you know, what we really like is this. And Well, what would it take to build power to get more of that? What would it look like? And I can't resist saying, and who's stopping us? <laughs> because that's, again, a way of, of building power. And so, uh, uh, but of course, in farming, as you know, it's not all one uh, We've got small farmers who are being forced out, and then we've got agro-business. And so we can talk about some of those issues a, a little later. On uh, the, the brother who raised the issue about uh, um, what do you do with employees uh, or union members who didn't come in, uh, uh, are, are, are not active, are the uh, passive dues payers. Well, you need to get them involved in something. And what's that something? Well, it's got to come from them. I think a mistake we've often made is, you know, hi, I'm from the union. I got a campaign I want you to be involved in. We think this is important, and I'm going to talk to you till you decide it's important too. Uh, as opposed to starting where, you know, like, hi, you know, uh, tell me about what you do. Tell me about what works here. Tell me about what makes you upset. Let me, let, uh, I'll tell you a little secret. I, I, I bat a little above my uh, pay grade at, at, at Harvard Law School. Uh, and I didn't realize why people kept calling me over, a, a, weird people over a lot of things. And of course it's because I know a zillion people and I know weird things about them. So the, mar so the marshal's office has somebody coming in from France, and they phone me because they know I probably know the 20 or 30 faculty who speak French. Uh, and, you know, it's not on their CV, and it's not because I, I want to know. I want to know people, what, what matters to them. What, so that then, that's a reservoir, if you think, for organizing. Then when we want to do something, I know some of the people who share values similar to me on certain issues, and we can start with that group, and then we can, you know, grow it. So it maybe starts with, you know, figuring out ways of actually just getting people together to talk to each other, to learn a little bit better, because that's part of our society, too, to sort of like, you know, and as Canadians, we don't like to talk about values, you know, we don't, you know, that's very, uh, very American. You know, we don't like to talk about, you know, we're Canadians, we don't. Uh, uh, but I think, you know, what we see is the right in Canada introducing all sorts of terrible things, and, uh, uh, and they talk the language of values. They talk the language uh, about what sort of society uh, we are and we could be. The uh, sister who asked the question about uh, uh, what, what unions are doing or what, what some of the best practices are for the, the precariat, uh, uh, well, some of it is being done. Um, I'll tell you one group that I, I, I've been very impressed with. Uh, I mean, there are specific things that unions can do through collective bargaining. We see unions doing this in the fast food area. We see it in uh, uh, retail, sort of getting contract language to guarantee hours, to have some control over the shifts, all of that. But what do you do about the ones who aren't going to be unionized with 50% plus one in a zillion years, right? What do you do about Well, we act as if, whoa, you know, you can't, get 50% plus one of your members to vote and therefore constitute a sole bargaining agent so there's nothing we can do. Well, look it up on the web. It's called coworker.org. And 
is two young women who worked for you know, uh, a number of years with the union and then decided they just wanted to help people, workers, uh, uh, self-organize. What a novel notion. I mean, that's what we're supposed to be doing. And so they decided that, uh, 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 that they would use uh, a web platform to help workers organize. So one of the first groups they worked with was uh, some worker who was a barista at uh, uh, Starbucks. Starbucks had a policy that you, you couldn't have tattoos. Well, for my generation, it's no big deal. But uh, anybody younger than me has a zillion of them. Uh, so so uh, they started a, a petition. Unlike most petitions, this one leaves the control with the person who started the petition. And so they ended up self-identifying thousands of baristas who, not surprisingly, all had tattoos, were opposed to this policy by Starbucks. Next thing you know, they identified her, plus a few others, who uh, uh, went and met with Starbucks management. Starbucks, by the way, uh, changed its policy, not surprisingly, but based on that, created a community of people within Starbucks who wanted to talk. Not surprisingly, some of them said, you know, the wages here aren't that good. And next thing you know, somebody else is working on that. Well, that's a way of starting to, to construct a community of interest that isn't preoccupied with what labor law says you have to do. It's what smart organizing says you have to do. How do you construct a community of interest? And don't worry about the labor law. Everything we do today at some point was illegal. So you might as well get over it and organize, and the law will follow us. It won't lead us. And so I think that's, uh, uh, that's, you know, there's a lot of really neat experiments happening out there. And some of them look like the labor movement of 100 years ago. And they, they couldn't have been that bad because they brought us where we are today. So. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Is a question over here. Is there any, are there any other questions? We could take a couple. Oh, sorry. Um, I want to thank you for bringing up the Quebec situation. I had a heck of a time having conversations with people in Alberta here. They were just calling the Quebec University students spoiled kids, uh, cheap education anyway. And I tried to say, no, there was a bigger principle here. These were people that believe that education should be paid for tax dollars and education should be free. And it was incredible how people didn't treat that movement with the respect it deserved. Well, it's the two solitudes of Canada. Uh, it, it, it was big news in Quebec, but it was in French. There's <laughs> another uh, question here. I have uh, just a comment to you. Sometimes the employer does the organizing for us. Uh, we currently have a government who wants to take away the sick leave from the uh, public service employees and uh, across Canada, and they're actually upset about it. So, uh, as I said, sometimes the employer uh, puts their foot in it, and yay for putting their foot in it. The, the only thing I would add to that is use that opportunity not just to roll that back, but to do it in such a way that you can you construct, uh, you help a whole lot of people sort of light a union fire, and that if that fire is lit properly, uh, it can last a lifetime. Why I'm excited about what happened in Quebec is I'm looking at the next 20 years. I'm looking at those hundreds of thousands of student leaders who went through, who developed, who took on a government, brought it down, won something, did it through mass struggle. I mean, wow. Uh, that transforms not just their lives, but the entire province. Now, what we need is two, three, many Quebecs, I guess.
Any other was, questions? No, I'm standing between th this group and the bar. I yes, well, just... well, for, well, first of all, I, I'd just like to thank you for lighting a fire under us about rethinking the concept of collect collective action, really. And thank so thank you so much. We have a small gift for you here. And oh. uh, huh? gosh, watch us. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. Thank you.